Some of you are looking at me all suspicious, like, is he actually a spy? I am a campus minister. All right, so we are going to be jumping into kind of the, 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 the bigger part of Romans chapter 9 tonight. Um, and kind of the big question that we're going to be answering tonight is, is God faithful to his promises even amidst his election to service? And the reason we're answering that question is because it's the question that Paul is answering. Um, and he says so in, in verse 6, he says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And so Paul is essentially answering this big question here. And the reason he's answering this question is because of where we left off last week uh, with Andy's sermon. Um, Paul is in anguish. He is in unceasing anguish in his heart because the whole of Israel has rejected the Messiah. The whole of Israel is lost and they have rejected the Messiah. And Paul lists all of these advantages that they had, the covenants, the glory, the worship, the giving of the law, the promises, the patriarchs, all of these things. He lists all of these things. And yet still they rejected the Messiah. And so Paul is in anguish. And then now, as he starts kind of this next section of Romans chapter 9, it's as if he's answering this question that's coming from the Jews. It's as if they're saying, well, if what you're saying is true, Paul, and we're all lost, then God's promises can't be true. God's promises to Abraham can't be true. And so that's why he's answering this question. Now, with Romans chapter 9, uh, answering this, this major question, is God faithful to his promises even amidst his election to service, there are some implicit questions within that, especially in this chapter. For instance, who has God elected? What did he elect them for? And is this fair? In a sense of, if God is electing people to do things, do we have a say in it? And how does all of that work, right? And so hopefully some of those questions are going to be things that we're going to be answering as we work through this text tonight. Um, but I want to say first, before we fully jump in, Romans chapter 9 is is one of a, a very, one of a kind of a select group of very hotly debated passages in the Bible. Um, there are a lot of theological implications that are drawn from this text. And some of you are probably pretty familiar with the fact that it's hotly debated. Um, and a lot of you, but my guess would be that a lot of you are more familiar with select verses within Romans chapter 9. Um, and so what I want to do tonight is focus a little bit less on the theological implications. We're going to touch on them because you can't really go through Romans chapter 9 without doing some of that. But what I want to do the most is I want to just go through Romans chapter 9 verse by verse as we normally do. And I want to give you the context. I want to show you why Paul is addressing this question. I want to show you who he's talking to, why they're asking the question. And then hopefully that context will help you to draw these theological implications with a little bit more knowledge as we go through as the text as a whole. And so let's jump in. Let's jump in here. Verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So if you notice right here in this first verse, he's, he's answering a posed question, and he makes a distinction between two different types of Israel, right? Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And what Paul's saying is there's two different Israels here. There's ethnic Israel from the lineage of Abraham, and there's spiritual Israel, those who believe. And that kind of goes back to Romans chapter 4, where, where Paul talks about how the Jews misinterpreted the promise to Abraham. They interpreted it as, as uh, those who were saved would be those who were from the lineage of Abraham, where really the children of Abraham, the true children of Abraham, were those who believe, and those who believe are saved, right? And so he's kind of restating this, but the difference is he's also talking about Israel being elected for service, and we'll get into that here. Verse 7, it says, Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but, because Isaac, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So verses 7 and 8 clearly show Paul's uh, interpretation of two different types of Israel, one spiritual, one ethnic, 
and he'll get on to define spiritual Israel later on in this text. Um, but what Paul is, is dealing with here really is, is Israel's election for service. God elected Israel to serve him and to bring about the lineage of the Messiah through his promise to Abraham. But Israel misinterpreted that promise. They thought because they're from the line of Abraham that they would be saved, right? And so what Paul is addressing here is that their election for service does not have a direct correlation to their salvation. Even though they had all of the benefits, all of the benefits mentioned, right? Mentioned, right? The, the covenant, the worship, the, the, the patriarchs, and then even Christ coming from their very own lineage. But their election to service does not have a direct correlation to their salvation, and so he goes on to show this by bringing about the example of two different brothers, who are obviously, if they're brothers, they're from the same lineage, to show that God does not show favoritism based on lineage at all. So the first one is, through Isaac your offspring, offspring shall be named. Isaac and Ishmael. God chose Isaac to bring about the lineage of the Messiah. Has nothing to do with, with whether Ishmael or Isaac were better. And he goes on to say, uh, to, to show that by saying that uh, with the example of Jacob and Esau, verse 11, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, so it wasn't based on, on who served him better or who was a better person, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. So it was simply that God is picking one over the other, not based on lineage, not based on how good they were or how bad they were, but he is electing some to serve him and to bring about the lineage of the Messiah. God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who called. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Now Paul's intentional wording in mentioning that this decision was made before they were Born was to show that God did not use preferential treatment based on what they had done or based on their lineage. Um, where we kind of get tripped up a little bit here, where it kind of gets tricky, is when Paul quotes from Genesis, saying, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Um, God did not choose Jacob over Esau because of anything either had done. He already, he already stated that, right? He simply chose Jacob over Esau to serve his purpose and bring you about the lineage of the Messiah. It's election for service. Um, and where we kind of get tripped up is when we, when we read this and we think, oh, Jacob I loved, so God loved Jacob, so he's saved, and God hated Esau, and so he's damned. That's where we kind of get tripped up. And I, and I want to show you something. Ryan, you can go ahead and pull up that uh, slide. This is just a few other biblical examples, verses, other verses in the Bible, where the term hate is simply used to mean loved less or maybe rejected, as opposed to actually I hate this person and so they're not going to be saved or they have no chance of being saved. Um, and so you guys can read through those. You can take it down in just a minute or two, Ryan. Um, but there's plenty of other examples in the Bible where hate is just simply means loved less. And so that's kind of the true thought here in this passage is that, that God simply loved Jacob more. Or maybe even better a thought would be the terms of as like rejected and accepted. So he rejected Esau for service, and he accepted Jacob for service to bring about the lineage of the Messiah and to serve him as his people. And so it does not have a direct correlation upon their salvation, elected for service, but not to salvation. And remember, that's the context here. Israel is saying, that's the question he's, answer, he's answering. Israel is saying, hey, God's promises to Abraham aren't true if we're not saved. And Paul's saying, no, his promises are true, you misinterpreted the promise. You thought that since you were elected for service, that that had a direct correlation with you being saved. And Paul's saying that this is, not, this is not the case. And so we have to remember the context here. God is trustworthy in his promises. He has been faithful to Israel, and they have been the ones who rejected him, despite all of the advantages that they had as being those who, who were chosen to serve him. But they rejected God. God chose Israel for service, not based on anything they had done in the same way as Jacob and Esau, but because God needed a people to serve his purposes and bring about the lineage of the Messiah. If anything, Israel had been given the most opportunity to receive the Messiah when he came, and yet they still chose to reject him. Moving into our second section here, um, and our second point is going to be God's pattern in his election for service. 
God's pattern in his election for service. And it's going to be Romans 9, verses uh, 14 through 23. God elects some for service, but not all for salvation. And the reason I have this point as God's pattern in his election for service is because I want to communicate the point, and, and you'll know why as we get into talking about Pharaoh and God hardening Pharaoh's heart. I want to communicate the point that it's not that we have it down to a science or something like that. It's like God does this and this and this, and you do this and this and this, and then you're good or whatever. But I want to communicate the fact that God does not randomly or arbitrarily choose people's salvation. God elects people for service, but he's, a God, he's not a God of, random, of randomness. He's God of logic and a God of order, and he does things by rules and by, by systems. And so that, that's why I chose this as our second point, God's pattern in his election for service. And so let's jump right in here. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So Paul begins to answer this question here of whether God is unrighteous for showing mercy to some and not to others. Now, at this point in the book of Romans, this should be a, pretty, uh, this should be a concept that we understand, right? Grace, mercy, these are not things that you can earn, and they're not things that are ever given to you because you did something for them. Otherwise, they're not grace. They're not mercy anymore, right? Um, we even understand that from just a, a, a life standpoint, right? If I steal my parents' car and I drive it and wreck it, my dad has a right to say, um, you owe me what it cost me for that car, and he has a right to be angry at me for the wrong that I did to him. He doesn't have an obligation to give me mercy, right? We, we understand that. But if he does give me mercy, it's not because of anything I did. It's because he chose to forgive the debt that I owe him, right? And so we understand that mercy, mercy is not something that God owes. And so he can show mercy to whoever he, he, he wants to show mercy and show compassion to whoever he wants to show compassion. Um, and Paul just kind of, I think he says it pretty flatly here. He just kind of, he doesn't really go into depth. He doesn't really talk about it. You know, he doesn't go into the theologically of why God shows mercy to this person and not this person. I think he just says it flatly because he's, uh, he's addressing the Israelites and kind of their, their mindset of, well, you know, how come he shows mercy to these people and not these people? And he's kind of just saying it flatly, like just saying it like it is. Well, he can show mercy on those who he wants to and doesn't have to on those who he doesn't want to. And so then verse 16, it says, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Again, if it was based on something that we did, then it wouldn't be mercy, right? And here's where we kind of get to, the, get to the big stuff, right, with Pharaoh and hardening his heart. Verse 17, this is going to be the, the couple verses that probably most of you are the most familiar with um, in chapter 9. And so in this section, find this kind of hotly debated, this hotly debated passage. Um, and what I want to do is I want to go in, I want to go through the passage, I want to go through these verses, and I want to explain them in their context as we've been doing. And then I want to take a, a couple biblical examples um, to, to show kind of God's pattern in his election for service, uh, namely the ones uh, that are being spoken of in this passage, Abraham, Pharaoh. Um, and I just want to look into them a little bit more in depth, and I hope that that will give us a better understanding and a better insight into what's going on here. So the first verse, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. So catch the contrast there. First he talks about Moses, and he talks about giving mercy to whom he wants to give mercy. And then he gives an opposite example of somebody who he used to serve him, and he says, I will harden whomever I harden. So he's got the contrast here. And remember, within the context, this is very applicable to Israel because they were chosen for service, but in the same way as Pharaoh, chosen for service, does not have a direct correlation to his salvation, in the same way as Pharaoh, Israel also was re re rejected and was obstinate towards God. And so it also did not have a direct correlation on their salvation as well. And so notice the contrast there. Moving on, it says, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? 
But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has... Oh, no, that's the next, that's the next point. All right. All right, so we've talked about the context here with Pharaoh and him bringing about this example, two opposing examples. But it's hard to read about God hardening somebody's heart without diving into the theological implications that that statement has, right? And so at this point, I want to kind of jump into the, the examples, the biblical examples um, that we kind of have in this passage. And so I want to start with the Jews first. God chose the Jews for honorable service. He elected them for service to, to him, to show uh, his, his, himself to the world, and to bring about the lineage of the Messiah, one who would save everyone. And then we started, and it was starting with God's call to Abraham back in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12. God calls Abraham, or he was Abram at the time, to, uh, to move away from his home, to leave everything, pack up his bags, and go somewhere he'd never been before. And that was a big thing. I mean, a- Abram had, like, essentially a small empire of land. Uh, he was getting well up in his age, probably not the age that you want to, like, pick up and, like, have new experiences and move halfway across the known world at that point. But he did it. He believed God, he obeyed him, and he, and he did it. And then in chapter 15, um, Abraham laments to God about not having any offspring, right? Uh, he says, you know, hey, I, I don't have a firstborn son, and so if I don't have a firstborn son, like the promises you gave me can't be fulfilled. And so God says, no, by, by this time next year, you will have a son. And that's where it says in Genesis, where Paul quotes in Romans chapter 4, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. I mean, Abraham was an obedient dude. He did everything God wanted him to do. I mean, for goodness sakes, in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham at 99 years old, God comes to him and establishes the covenant of circumcision. And he does it. He's an obedient guy. Now let's contrast that with Pharaoh. When we read this passage, it sounds pretty cut and dry. The scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, so that then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Um, But what I want to do is I want to go back to Exodus, and I want to take a look at each instance where Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And uh, Ryan, you can go ahead and pull up the first one, the first slide, if you'd like. So Moses and Aaron go to... to, uh, go to Pharaoh, and they say, hey, let God's people go. And Aaron's staff becomes a snake, and Pharaoh's like, mm, nah, no big deal. And his, his staff becomes a snake to show God's legitimacy, to show his power, to show that he means business. And, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but any time God reveals himself to mankind, it is for two reasons. Number one, to bring his people to him, and number two, to let everybody else have no excuse for their obstinance and rejection and disobedience of him. And so he goes and he does this miraculous power. It's the same thing with Jesus. He did the miracles to show the legitimacy of who he was, to show the legitimacy that he was God. He was God's son. He was the Messiah. And to, to go of legitimacy to his words. And so, so his, his staff becomes a snake and Mo, Pharaoh's like, nah, no big deal. Not going not gonna to do it. And so in 714, the Lord says to Moses, uh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and he refuses to let the people go. So harden, he hardens his first heart, or he hardens his first heart. He had a lot of hearts. It's a cat, nine lives. They have nine hearts too, right? That's how that works. Um, he hardens his own heart. And so then we see, uh, we see in, the next, in the next one, after the plague of blood, it simply states that Pharaoh's heart became hard again. So he remained hardened against God. And then the third, the third plague, the plague of frogs, Pharaoh hardened his own heart again in 815. Then after the plague of gnats, Pharaoh's heart simply stayed the same. He remained hardened against God. 
And after the plague of flies, Pharaoh hardened his heart again. Then after the plague of livestock, Pharaoh's heart simply just remained hardened again. And then after, on the fifth plague, we finally see the pattern switch in 912. Uh, is that on there? Yes, it is. Cool. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So out of ten plagues, Pharaoh hardens his heart for the first five, his own heart. And then God steps in and hardens his heart. Now, consider the, 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 the possibility here, or the, consider the the things going around in the background here. God knows everything. We believe that God knows everything, right? And so if God knows everything, he knows everything that's going to happen before it happens. And if God knows everything, he also knows everything that could happen but doesn't. So if you're in a chess game, he knows every move that you could make but you don't. It never becomes reality. So God knows everything that could happen that doesn't. He knows everything that's going to happen before it does. And so tell me this, why did he give Pharaoh five chances to obey him? Pharaoh had five chances where God said, let my people go. And five times Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Now tell me this, was God surprised by that? No. God knew every possible outcome. God, so God knows that regardless of how many chances he gives Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened against God, and he's not going to give in to God. He's too prideful, he's too stubborn, he's too obstinate, and he's not going to humble himself in obedience to God. And so God knows this before it happens. And so again, why does God give him five chances? Consider the possibility here. In Exodus and I don't remember the exact number, so I won't even try, but it, it, it quotes so many thousands of Egyptians following the Israelites out into the wilderness. I mean, they packed up their bags, bags too. It's kind of like a reverse Abraham. Like, they packed up their ba bags. They saw the, the power and, and, and the might and the legitimacy of God, and they followed the Israelites. They left everything, too. In, followed Moses, God's appointed man on earth, into the desert. Consider the possibility Five times, Pharaoh could have repented. Maybe he, too, could have fell on his knees and said, Lord, I repent. I'm sorry for being obstinate and stubborn. He could have had a contrite heart, humbled himself before God, let the people go. Maybe even been a part of God's people like the rest of the Egyptians who followed the Israelites out. God gave him five chances. And then we see the pattern switch. Then we see the pattern switch. God hardens his heart. And then interestingly enough, and I don't know if God just did this to confuse us or what, but God steps back again, doesn't harden his heart, and Pharaoh hardens his heart again, and then the, the remaining three more times, God hardens Pharaoh's heart and uses him for his own glory. Now, maybe Pharaoh just like beat God to the punch and was like, I'm going to harden it before you can. I don't know. He might have been that kind of guy. But then God used him for his glory. And so I, think that I feel like this pattern is very interesting to see how God deals with a stubborn and unrepentant heart. Truly, it's, it's a showing of his grace, is it not? It's a showing of his grace, giving someone a chance that he already knows is not going to submit to him. And he gave Pharaoh five chances. He revealed himself with all of these plagues. There was no excuse for Pharaoh to be like, ah, I'm not really sure if God exists. The plague of blood, the plague of flies, the plague of gnats, the plague of frogs. I mean, come on. He knew God was real. He just didn't want to submit. God gave him no excuse. And in the same way, what Paul is talking about in Romans, the Israelites had no excuse. Their ancestors saw the signs and wonders, but they had the covenants, the worship, the glory, all of the things mentioned. And that's why Paul is in anguish for his brothers according to the flesh. He is in anguish because they have no excuse for the rejection of the gospel. My friends, we don't have an excuse either. 
We have no excuse for our rejection of the gospel. We may not see miracles and crazy, crazy things like, like supernatural plagues, but we have God's word. And going back all the way to Romans chapter 1, where Paul talks about nature revealing God's glory. And even that is enough for us to know that there is a God. We have no excuse when we rebel against God. Pharaoh rebelled against God. Israel rebelled against God. And we rebel against God. We have no excuse. I was going to bring up the story of Cain and Abel, but I feel like I'm going, I feel like I'm going long. I've got only so much time, guys. Sorry. But Cain and Abel kind of applies to this. I'm not going to talk about it now. <laughs> Take that. So God gave Pharaoh multiple choices, right? And essentially what it boils down to is God let Pharaoh damn himself. He had no excuse. He rebelled against God. He was obstinate. He was stubborn. He refused to submit to God. And God let him damn himself. And the reason I bring this up and the reason I go into this is, is not just because it's almost impossible to, to, to deal with this, this passage without going into these theological implications, but because I want to show you guys that God is a God of logic, not arbitrary randomness. He's not sitting up in heaven, or he's not sitting before he created everything, saying, Moses is going to be used for my glory, but in a good way, and Pharaoh's going to be used for my glory, but in a bad way. And so he's going to be saved, and he's going to be damned. That's not how God does things. God reveals himself to humanity for the same two purposes. That's where I'm going to jump down a little bit. In verse 22, it says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Pharaoh, a vessel of wrath prepared for destruction. God endured with much patience. That's God's mercy and his grace. In the same way, every time that we rebel against God, he is enduring with much patience, showing us mercy, allowing the creature to defy the creator. And he is enduring with much patience. But every time God reveals himself to humanity, it is to either bring, him, bring his people to him, verse 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, or to reveal himself so that anyone who rejects him and disobeys him has no excuse. Make no mistake, my friends, God will use you for his purposes. Whether you're an Abraham or a Pharaoh, God will use you for his purposes. Moving on into verse 21, just a little bit more. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and yet another for dishonorable use? So Paul continues his answer um, by using the analogy of the potter and the clay found in Jeremiah 18. Um, now, when, when Paul says the same lump, uh, I think that he's still ta he's talking about all of Israel, not all of humanity. And the reason I say that, excuse me, is because uh, he's drawing this this image in this and from uh, from Jeremiah chapter 18, and and he's talking to the Israelites here. This is he's talking to the Israelites. He kind of switches. Sometimes he's talking to the Israelites. Sometimes he's talking to Gentiles. Sometimes he's talking to everybody in Romans. But this passage, he's talking to the Israelites. And so Jeremiah 18, being good little children studying in synagogues and stuff, they would have known, okay, I remember Jeremiah 18. And so he uses this illustration because it's something that would come easily to their mind. And so when he says one lump, he's talking about the whole of Israel. And so all of Israel was designated for service to God and then to bring about the lineage of the Messiah. But not all of Israel was designated for honorable service versus dishonorable service. And so the point he's trying to get across again still is that Israel's election for service does not have a correlation, direct correlation with their salvation. And so moving on into verses 22 and 23, uh, what if God desiring to show his wrath and make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Now I want to get a little bit into the verb tense here. 
The verb that's used for in prepared for destruction is used in the passive tense, the passive voice. And so essentially what that means is that it's not God's action of preparing somebody for, for destruction, but it is the action upon the individual. And then prepared in advance is used in the active voice. Did I say active voice t- twice? Okay, passive active. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> Prepared beforehand is used in the active voice. So hence it is God's action. And so God in his foreknowledge see, knows that someone is going to be stubborn and obstinate against him. And so in his foreknowledge, he says, I'm still going to use you for my glory. And that's all that's really saying there. God knows everything that's going to happen before it happens, right? And so he's going to use people for his glory. in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. So God's pattern in election for service. God does not arbitrarily decide human salvation. He is purposeful, enduring with much patience. He is graceful and fair, and it is not God who chooses our damnable actions. Um, Ultimately, it's we who choose our damnable actions because we are without excuse. Pharaoh knew enough about God to be without excuse. Israel had all these things from God, and they were without excuse. Moving into our third point, and I'm going to go quick. I feel like I'm going late on time. Point three is God's purpose, verses 24 through 29. God's purpose. And we've talked about that a little bit already when we talked about how when God reveals himself to humanity, it is to bring his people to him and to make others without excuse for rejecting him. And so God's purpose Paul moves on to show God's purpose in calling some to service. In verse 24, we see it says, Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, Those who are not my people I will call my people, and her who was not beloved I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And so Paul quotes from the Old Testament to prove his point here. Hosea chapter 2, verse 23, and chapter 1, verse 10, to show that some Gentiles, not ethnically Jewish, have been called to be God's people. And so this is Paul's final description of the children of promise from back in in, in, uh, verse 8, right, where he says, this means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. It's not ethnic Israel who's the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring. And so here he defines that a remnant of Jews, and the Gentiles who believe. Then Paul quotes from Isaiah. He says, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of sons of Israel be as sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And so what's interesting here is that the the passage that that, uh, Paul is quoting from, uh, from Isaiah is a passage that's talking about God's saving grace as he intervenes and, and saves Israel from impending doom from the Assyrian army. I mean, they're going to wipe them out. And the reason he quotes this is to show that just because God sometimes saved all of Israel from a physical standpoint, it did not mean that they were all saved. He was preserving his remnant to fulfill his promise to Abraham, which again, that's the main question of this text. God was faithful to his promise to Abraham. He preserved the remnant. Christ came through the lineage of Abraham. And one of my, one of my favorite uh, commentators, his name is Leon Morris, and I, I kind of use him, I use him a lot for everything I do on Romans. Um, but he said about this, he said, it was stupid to think that since the whole nation had not entered the blessing, that the promise of God had failed. The promise had not been made to the whole nation and and had never been intended to apply to the whole nation. And so this is kind of where Paul ties this passage together. In the beginning of the chapter, he speaks of the sorrow that not all of his brethren is, is saved according to the flesh because they don't believe in God. They think that they're good because they're from the lineage or because they're the children of promise. So then he defines the true children of promise are those who believe, some Jews, some Gentiles. And the defining characteristic of spiritual Israel is those who believe. And that goes back to Romans chapter 4, which is from Abraham, believing God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
And without going up too much into next week's text, Paul moves on to say that Israel is wholly responsible for their own rejection of the gospel. They had every chance, every benefit to believe, and yet they still rejected God. God called Israel to service, and they rejected his son. Now, not every, I don't think that every biblical text has to have, like, an application. I don't think that every biblical text has a direct application to us today. Um, obviously, 1 Timothy says that all scripture is, is useful for teaching and, and uh, um, butchering, but you guys know the verse. Um, but I think that this one, I think that this one does have, have an application to us. And so we kind of ask the question, what does all this mean to us? In relation to the text, literally, we are the Gentiles, right? We're the ones that have been grafted in to the promise. And we'll get more into that in Romans chapter 11, which, by the way, I have no idea how I'm going to preach that text. It's talking about being grafted in and grafted off and grafted back in, and it's crazy. We'll see. But as far as relatability, we're more like the Israelites in this text, right? We're more like the Israelites in this text, in all honesty. We've been grafted into the promises of God. We've been given his son. We've been given his word in like a hundred different translations, whichever one we want, right? We have scholars upon scholars who are like super smart people, and we can read all of their, their, their uh, interpretations of the Bible. We have all of these archaeological discoveries that, that prove the Bible is real. We have all of these things. The majority of us have grown up in Christian homes, for all intents and purposes, compared to the rest of the world, we grew up in a very Christian nation. I mean, we have all of the benefits, all of the advantages, and yet still sometimes, like Israel, we reject God. The Israelites were without excuse. They thought because God had elected them for service that they would be saved. They thought that because they were from the lineage of Abraham that God would show partiality to them. In the same way, my friends, God will show no partiality to us because we're from a lineage of Christians. He will show no partiality to us because we went to church our entire lives. God does not show partiality to anyone. God will show us mercy through our submission and our obedience to him, and through that mercy, we are granted salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. God's purpose in his revelation to mankind is to, in his grace and in his patient endurance, reveal himself. Many will reject him, and some will accept him in obedience. And in his grace, he has given us more than enough chances, just like Pharaoh. And it was God's fault. It was not God's fault that Israel rejected him. It wasn't God's fault that Pharaoh rejected him. And if we reject God, it's not his fault either. God is a loving God, but he is also a just God. His justness requires that he act according to a specific standard. And his lovingness is him showing us grace, giving us more and more chances. Many are called to service, but to those who believe are called to salvation. And it is only by his grace that we are saved. Let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to unite, and we thank you for your word. Even the tough passages, God, that, that sometimes are hard to, hard to figure out exactly how it applies to us or exactly what all is meant by it, or even the ones that we sometimes disagree on. But God, we thank you for revealing yourself to us. We thank you for giving us your word, for giving us your son. And Lord, I pray today that, that we would realize all of the advantages that we have, God, and that we would not take those for granted. God, I pray that we would follow you as Abraham did, not as the rest of Israel as they just checked things off the list, but that we would follow you in believing faith. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.